Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. After a brief interruption in my lectures, I am again presenting a very interesting and uh, different topic, and that is acquired disorders of dermal connective tissue. Since this is a big chapter, I am going to divide this chapter into different lectures. So today it will be the first lecture or part one of the acquired disorders of dermal connective tissue. With the, at the start of the lecture, I am going to introduce a term which is called as the dermatoporosis. Dermatoporosis is actually the skin aging and it affects, the aging affects both epidermis and dermis. And this aging results in increased translucency of the skin, skin fragility, the skin is lax and wrinkled, and with easy tendency to bruise and form linear or stellate scars. This dermatoporosis occur both as a result of intrinsic aging or as a result of UV exposed aging. Some environmental factors like cigarette smoking also promote to increased aging. Wrinkles are usually the sign of aging and they may be defined as the creases or furrows on the skin surface. The photomechanisms underlying skin aging. As a result of ultraviolet exposure, there is reduced collagen biosynthesis and increased production of matrix metalloproteins, which both inhibits collagen fibril synthesis and promote the fragmentation of the collagen fibrils. This lead to reduction in healthy collagen and accumulation of damaged collagen. So the damaged collagen is unable to maintain the smoothness of the skin and this results in uh, creation of wrinkles or skin creases. Smoking has a very important role in uh, causing early aging. And those who are heavy smokers, they have a cigarette face that is characterized by pale gray wrinkled skin with a gaunt appearance. Heavy smokers are five times more likely to be wrinkled than the non-smokers of the same age. So this is how bad the smoking is. And cigarette smoking probably has at least as much effect on facial wrinkles as the sun exposure. So a person may be a sedentary worker, an indoor worker, but is a smoker. So his aging will be similar to the person who is continuously working under the sun. Wrinkles type. So once we see a wrinkled face, we divide the wrinkles into various subtypes. The first or the most superficial wrinkles are called as the crinkles. Crinkles are very fine wrinkles. You can see these crinkles on the side of the cheeks, on around the lips, on the mandib on the chin area. So these are the fine wrinkles occur in aged skin. They disappear when the skin is slightly stretched and they are caused by deterioration of elastin. So the crinkles are seen in marked form of dermal, mid-dermal elastolysis. So this is not because of, because of the collagen disintegration, it is because of the elastin disintegration. Then comes the glyphic wrinkles or the dynamic wrinkles. These are the creases which are accentuation of the normal skin markings. They occur on a skin which has, which has been prematurely aged by elastotic degeneration that is caused by sunlight and other factors like smoking. Then comes the linear furrows. Linear furrows are those wrinkles which remain static and they do not change with the expression or movements. They are long, straight and slightly curved grooves that are seen on the faces of elderly, elderly uh, individuals. They include the horizontal furrows on the forehead, the big crow feet on the side of the eyes, then the nasolabials, then these linear smoker lines and etc. So these are the fixed uh, wrinkles. Elastot actinic elastosis. Actinic elastosis is another component of uh, hypertrophic skin photo damage. 
it is characterized by yellow discoloration and thickening of the skin and histologically by reduction in collagen and accumulation of amorphous masses of degenerated elastic fibers in the derms. So both the collagen and elastin are involved. There is reduction in collagen because of chronic sun exposure and disintegration of elastin because again due to ultraviolet light exposure. This is a cumulative lifetime exposure of UV radiation rather than episodic intense UV exposure and more mainly seen in outdoor workers. It does not present until the fourth decade of life and the, as fair the skin is, the more uh, early and more severe will this present. So this is severe actinic elastosis. The light exposed areas are affected, particularly the forehead, bald scalp and back of the neck, uh, front of the neck as well. The affected skin is diffusely thickened and yellowish on the neck and is divided by well-defined furrows into an irregularly rhomboid pattern, cutis rhomboidalis nuki. There may also be sharp marginated, sharply marginated, thickened plaques on face and neck, but these are, but they are not always symmetrical. Actinic elastosis may be complicated by actinic granuloma, which we are going to discuss later on. So the clinical variant of actinic elastosis include the actinic comedonal plaques or the favor ricochet syndrome. Actinic elastosis may form into confluent plaques which are studded with, these are the confluent yellow plaques which are studded with comedons, most commonly seen in periorbital skin. They are usually symmetrical, but unilateral and cis or circumscribed are also seen. Then elastotic nodule of the ear, again a form of actinic elastosis. This variant presents a single or multiple firm papules that occur on the anterior crust of antihelix, usually in middle-aged or elderly males. Their significance is that they sometimes have a pearly edge and telangiectasias and may resemble basal cell carcinoma. Histology reveals aggregate of amorphous elastotic material with, with sometimes degradation of underlying cartilage. The differential diagnosis include plain xanthomas, pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and colloid myelium. The process is halted but not reversed by stringent photoprotection. Stopping smoking is presumed to slow the progression. So the actinic elastosis is mainly characterized by amorphous basophilic material in papillary and upper reticular dermis, which signify the elast degeneration of elastic fibers, which we also call as the solar elastosis. Along with this, there is an atrophy of overlying epidermis. You can see the epidermis is flattened with loss of reti ridges. The management of solar actinic elastosis is strict sun protection and topical application of alpha hydroxy acids like lactic acid, glycolic acid, or citric acid, which may lead to modest improvement in photo damaged skin. More impressive results are obtained by topically applied 0.1% retinoin cream. The retinoids reduce the matrix metalloprotein expression and partially restoring the level of fibrillin 1 and collagen 1 and 7 in the papillary dermis. The retinoids are a little irritating, so sometimes you have to dilute the retinoids in some vanishing or cold creams. Non-ablative lasers which help in photoaging include 1320 nanometer ND or 1540 RBM glass laser. Keratoelastoides marginalis. This condition is the collagenous and elastotic marginal plaques on hands and is an acquired dermatosis affecting the dermal connective tissue. The papules and plaques form on the dominant hand along the radial aspect of the index finger. This is the radial aspect of the index finger. 
and first web space and another aspect of thumb and the little finger. The condition is reported in manual workers and entirely from geographical areas with high solar irradiation. irradiation. Histologically, it is characterized by hyperkeratosis, sore toothing of retty ridges, thick collagen fibers, and elastotic degeneration, or an often calcification. Alloyed, uh, adult colloid myelium or colloid degeneration of the skin is also a form of actinic damage. The colloid degeneration of skin is defined histologically by presence of colloid in the dermal papillae and present as yellowish translucent papules, nodules, or plaques on the light exposed skin. The adult colloid myelium manifests as multiple mylia like papules on light exposed skin, particularly of the face. I will see the pictures, let's show the pictures later on. Usually, it affects the fair skin individuals, the outdoor workers, and those with prolonged sun exposure. It is also attributed to trauma and prolonged contact with photodynamic phenols. Cases are reported after long use of strong hydroquinone bleaching creams. So this is colloid myelium. The, this is a papule, skin papule, which is comprising mainly of intradermal deposits of uh, faceted eosinophilic material. There is no surrounding inflammatory reaction. On high power, this is the faceted nature of, nature of the deposits are more clear. So the clinical features comprising of small dermal papules, 1 to 5 mm in diameter, yellowish brown or sometimes translucent, developing slowly, symmetrically on sun-exposed areas. They are soft to touch and may release their gelatinous contact, content when punctured. The most frequent involved site is the face, especially around the orbit, dorsal surface of the hands, back and side of the neck and ear. These are all sites of actinic damage. Most cases reach the maximum development within three years and then remain unchanged. So these are small yellowish papules which are seen on the nose and on the cheek. In this case, there is predominantly unilateral street orange plaques involving the forehead and the nose. The differential diagnoses include the juvenile colloidal myelium, where there are multiple translucent yellow papules on cheek, nose, perioral skin, and onset before puberty, and it is familial and associated with lignus conjunctivitis. Then nodular colloidal degeneration comprising of flesh-colored nodules on the face, scalp, and chest, which are usually solitary. Then nodular amyloid is also associated with a single flesh-colored nodule and may be associated with myeloma. So these are the differential diagnoses. Now let's discuss the management. There is no completely satisfactory inter intervention. The good results is claimed by dermabrasion and long pulse IBM YAG laser or uh, by use of carbon dioxide fractional lasers. Multiple um, chemical peel with strong acids may also be tried. Now we are going to discuss all the conditions which are characterized by a cutaneous atrophy. So atrophy of skin is the term which is applied to the clinical changes produced by decrease in dermal connective tissue and is characterized by thinning and loss of elasticity. So the connective tissue is uh, decreased and there is thinning as well as decreased elasticity. The skin usually appears smooth and finely wrinkled and feels soft and dry. Veins and other subcutaneous structures are very conspicuous and it is often associated with loss of hair follicles and telangiectasias due to loss of connective tissue support of the capillaries. There are different acquired forms of cutaneous atrophy. The generalized cutaneous thinning, the first is the aging, which we described before, then rheumatoid disorders, 
or connective tissue disorders are also associated with cutaneous thinning and the glucocorticoids, both exogenous and endogenous, like a Cushing syndrome is associated with generalized cutaneous thinning. Acquired percolodermas also come in cutaneous thinning, as well as the estrias, the atrophic scars, spontaneous atrophic scarring of the cheeks, acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans, which is a manifestation of Lyme's disease, then atrophodermas, which are of different type of atrophodermas like follicular, linear, and atrophoderma of Piscini and Perineae, paroxysmal hematoma of the finger, and pan atrophies, which are local and facial pan atrophy. We are going to discuss all these diseases one by one. So first, let's discuss atrophy due to corticosteroids. A common happening, uh, especially uh, the dermatology patients, because we prescribe both oral and topical corticosteroids to our patients. And these steroids result in cutaneous atrophy in dose-related pharmacological pattern. The effect is more severe with more potent steroids. The effect is most marked when potent steroids are topically applied under occlusion. The skin becomes thin, fragile, and transparent, and stria develop. The severe dermal atrophy can follow intralineal injection of triamcinolone, particularly if higher concentrations like 40 mg per ml is directly used without dilution. The pathophysiology striars are known to inhibit the formation of the steroids are known to inhibit the formation of glucose aminoglycans. Topical corticosteroids rapidly suppress hyaluron sulfatase synthetase 2 in the dermis. The fibroblasts become sunken, and they, although their number do not decrease, topical steroids also inhibit the activity of enzymes which are involved in collagen biosynthesis, and they are shown to depress the synthesis of both type 1 and type 3 collagen in vivo. Pathology, the earliest histopathological change is marked thinning of the epidermis with flattening of retiridges. This is followed by the thinning of dermis, which can be measured by skin fold uh, calipers or by ultrasonography. Presentation. Skin becomes thin and fragile and easily bruised. Changes are generalized in patients of systemic corticosteroids and localized in case of topical corticosteroids. The, uh, these findings are more marked on photodamaged areas Investigation, consider measuring the blood glucose level and bone density if systemic corticosteroids are used for a prolonged period of time. So it can cause both diabetes and osteoporosis. Management, it suggested that local and oral vitamin C therapy help in restoring the normal skin thickness. Current application of retinoic acid may partially prevent the epidermal atrophy due to steroids. Intralegional saline injections are given as a, when there is a localized atrophy due to topical or intralegional steroids. Multiple injections are required, maybe four or five at regular intervals, which can be two weeks or more. Prevention is clearly the best approach. This includes use of steroid sparing systemic drugs and topical agents either use potent steroids under dilution or use these uh, potent steroids under occlusive dressings only on for a limited period of time or replace the topical steroid with calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus. Then another condition due to, uh, due to atrophy of skin, this is triad distancy. They are linear scars uh, that are formed uh, in areas of the dermal damage produced by the stretching of the skin and it's characterized histologically by thinning of the epidermis as well as the dermis with fine dermal collagen. They are common, see, commonly seen in adolescents and associated with, associated with increase in size of a particular region, particularly over the abdomen and breast in pregnancy and develop in the shoulders and back in the, the, those who are uh, doing weightlifting and gym. They are also a feature of Cushing's disease and induced by local or systemic corticosteroids and also seen in Marfan syndrome and reported in HIV-positive patients which are receiving 
protease inhibitors like indenovir. Pathology. The epidermis is thin, flattening of dermal papillae. Dermal collagen is thin, uh, eosinophilic bundles oriented in a straight line parallel to the surface. Recent genomic analysis of otherwise normal individuals with stria has revealed association with genes that affect expression of matrix proteins like collagen, elastin, and fibronectin. The clinical features of stria distancy are, it is the commonest site for obesity-related stria are the outer aspect of thighs, the lumbosacral region in boys, and thighs, buttocks, and breast in girls. Early lesions may be raised and irritable, but soon they become flat, smooth, with livid red or bluish in color. The surface is finely wrinkled and the commonly irregularly linear, several centimeters long and 1 to 10 millimeter wide. They are generally pale than the surrounding skin. So these are the um, uh, linear stria seen on the back of a young person, initially giving the bluish hue, but later on they turn, they'll turn white. Management. Numerous unproven remedies are available, but no substantiated evidence that topical therapy prevent or accelerate the healing. Some cases respond to low-potency topical retinoid cream like 0.5% retinoin. So the younger stria respond, the erythema of younger stria respond to 585 nanometer pulse dilaser. Fractional photothermolysis is used in chronic stria. That is, uh, in addition, uh, fractional CO2 lasers is also used. Application of silicon gel may be a beneficial, but rather there is no other proven benefits. Then comes the perchlodermas, and in this chapter, we are going to discuss the acquired perchlodermas. For the congenital perchlodermas, please refer to my previous lectures. Perchloderma is the descriptive term that comprises of a few things. The first is atrophy. The second is the reticulate pigmentation, and third is telangiectasis. Congenital perchloderma is a feature of lots of inherited disorders like Kindler syndrome, dyskeratosis congenita, rothman thompson syndrome, Vary syndrome, and erythrocleroderma variballis. But perchloderma may also occur as a response of uh, injury to skin, like cold, heat, or ionizing radiation. Perchloderma of civet is a radiation mediated um, by photosensitizing chemicals in cosmetics. So in this picture, you can see the skin atrophy. You can see the reticulate hyperpigmentation and fine telangiectasias. Perchloderma is a feature of some systemic autoimmune diseases like dermatomyositis, lupus erythematosus, and early SLE. Perchloderma atrophic and vascular is the earliest presenting feature of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, typically stage 1A and 2A. Then comes the atrophic scars. Scars can be of different type, atrophic and hypertrophic. So we are discussing the atrophic scar, which result from destruction of connective tissue by trauma or inflammatory changes, varicella, tertiary syphilis, certain tuberculates, Deep mycosis, especially sporotrichosis, onico, uh, oncosarchiasis, cutaneous lupus erythematosus, lupus vulgaris, leave atrophic scars, and sclerosis. Exposure to ionizing radiation will give rise to atrophy, pigmentation, and telangiectasia, so the pyridoderma like changes. Then, stellate or linear scars following trivial trauma is seen in. Porphyria cutanea trada and prolonged use of potent topical steroids. Brown pseudo scars are developed in shins of diabetic patient, which is called as the diabetic dermopathy. Congenital erosive and vascular dermatitis with reticulate scarring. This is a rare condition uh, uh, present at, at birth with signs suggestive of congenital viral infection that include erythema, blistering, erosions, and crusting, involving more than 75% of the skin. As it heals over the course of months, it leaves soft reticulate scarring on the limbs along the long axis. Their neurodevelopmental problem and differential diagnosis include Gold syndrome, rothman thompson and aplasia cutis. And such infants are successfully treated by silicone sheet dressing. 
Then another condition is spontaneous atrophic scarring of the cheek. You can see the scarring of the cheek. A rare condition, and the scars develop spontaneously, seen in young children and adults. The scars are shallow atrophic, with sharp margins, linear, rectangular, or verily formed, and may be preceded by slight erythema or scaling. There is no history of trauma. Differential diagnoses include atrophoderma vermiculata, chickenpox scar, and artifacta. Acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans is a manifestation of Lyme's disease and it's a late manifestation that is characterized by insidious onset of painless, dull red nodule or plaques on extremities that slowly extend centrifugally for several months or years, leaving central areas of atrophy. Condition is due to infection with spirochete borrelia burgdorferi that is transmitted by a tick bite, which is exodus. The disease occur mainly in Northern and Central Europe, occasionally in Africa and rare in UK, America, Australia, and Asia, mostly between 30 to 60 years. Histologically, it is characterized by thin epidermis. You can see the epidermis with flattened retiridges. Then there is a lacanoid infiltrate without signs of true interface. And then there is superficial and deep perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. Then further, on higher magnification, the infiltrate is predominantly lymphocytes and plasma cells. So plasma cells is not common in other non-specific dermatoses. Thick collagen bundles are present in the entire dermis. So the clues to the diagnosis of chronic cutaneous borreliosis include Lacanoid arrangement of the infiltrate in upper dermis without interface change, epidermal atrophy, and thick collagen bundles. However, the diagnosis must be confirmed by identification of spirochetes with silver stain or by PCR. Clinical features. Most individuals are country dwellers um, living in villages with a history of tick bite. Uh, the lesion is characterized by dull red, bluish red nodule or plaque, more or less infiltrated on feet or leg, less often forearm and hands, associated with acral pain and paresthesias, erythema, chronicum, migrants present at the same time, which is characterized by single or multiple annular erythemas. The active inflammatory stage persists for months or years, and central area enter into atrophic phase, where the skin is smooth, hairless, and tissue paper-like, Dull red pigmented or poikilodermatous. The infiltrated plaque with atrophic skin. A subcutaneous nodule may develop around knee and elbow. Gator like sclerosis of lower third of the leg. Morphia of trunk and lichen sclerosis are reported. Involvement of giant joint capsule and bone results in limitation of the joint movements, of, especially of hand and feet and shoulder. So, the complications. Very rarely squamous cell carcinoma develop in this area. Late manifestation of Lyme borreliosis is lymphocytoma and neurological defects. The bacteria are eradicated by systemic antibiotics, but some systemic features like neuroborreliosis persist. In atrophic stage, diagnosis is usually readily made and confirmed histologically. Serology is used for confirmation. Management is oral antibiotic, which is given for one month. Usually it is doxycycline or amoxicillin. Improvement occurs gradually and may not become apparent after several weeks after the course of treatment. If the antibody titer is high, there are clinical features of systemic disease like neuroborreliosis, then intravenous benzyl penicillin of ciftrioxone or cefotaxime should be used for three weeks. So the treatment letter is oral antibiotic, first line doxycycline or amoxicillin. And in case of systemic disease, intravenous antibiotics, which is benzyl penicillin. Then comes a topic which is again very important and this is called as the atrophodermis. These are actually the disorders of cutaneous atrophy but they have a particular appearance. The follicular atrophodermas manifest as the picture shows 
dimple like depressions at the follicular orifices associated with, with one of a small number of genetic syndrome. So it gives an appearance that the skin is pricked by, say, common pain, multiple common pain injury scars. It may manifest at birth and may not become apparent until late childhood and usually involves back of hands and feet and associated with following conditions like conradi hunerman happel syndrome, basics dupri crystal syndrome, and hyperkeratosis palmoplantaris. There is no proven treatment. Then linear atrophoderma, also known as atrophoderma of Molin. It is probably an atrophic variant of morphia. Cases are sporadic and worldwide. Most cases are seen in childhood and adolescence. Leukonychia is associated and successfully treated with methotrexate. So you can see this molen atrophoderma. There are linear atrophic plaques in distribution of Blaschko lines, sometimes having zostriform appearance. Then comes the atrophoderma of Pacini and Perineae. The condition represents the atrophic variant of morphia, in which one or more patches of skin becomes bluish and sharply depressed with no surrounding erythema. Most cases present in childhood and adolescence, and probable association is with morphia or borrelia. Histological changes show increased pigmentation of basal layer, edematous changes in collagen, and in the lower dermis and elastic tissue is clumped and scanty. There is mild to moderate dermal perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. Clinically characterized by the lesions are generally asymptomatic. They are single or multiple range in size from 2 cm to many cm. You can see the huge lesions. The lesions are round or oval and confluent to form irregular patches. They are slightly depressed below the level of normal skin. Back is almost always involved and chest and abdomen is frequently involved. Histologically, sclerosis may be prominent in morphia and absent in atrophoderma of Pacini and Priya. It is just mild atrophy but no sclerosis. The patches extend very slowly, increase in number for 10 years or more and persist unchanged. No treatment is of proven efficacy. Puva, um, Sorolin and UVA has helped some patient. Hydroxychloroquine it is used. A case which is associated with borreliosis responds to doxycycline. A paroxysmal hematoma of finger or Eschenbach syndrome. This condition presents a sudden spontaneous onset of one or more painful hematomas in the fingers usually middle age and female. Cause is hypothesia due to localized acquired fragility of vascular connective tissue. There is sudden bruising on the volar aspect of the fingers spontaneously, but no evidence of ischemia. There are no comorbids. Now the topic to be discussed is pan atrophy. So this cutaneous atrophy is different from pan atrophy in uh, panatrophy, skin along with the underlying structures are also atrophic. So the localized panatrophy is a rare disorder involving partial or total loss of subcutaneous fat, atrophy of overlying skin, sometimes associated with atrophy of muscle and bone. And the syndrome represents the end result of more than one pathological processes and many cases are variants of morphia. The atrophic area exhibit reduced sympathetic response, that is sweating. Two groups are, are identified. There are two types of panatrophy. The panatrophy of Grover and sclerotic panatrophy. So panatrophy of Grover's is characterized by only atrophy and there is no sclerosis. And uh, it follows by the loss of subcutaneous tissue. Most cases occur in women at two to four, second or fourth decade. Then sclerotic panatrophy. This follows a typical morphia or similar sclerotic changes in dermal collagen which precede the atrophy. 
So in panatrophy of Grover, there is no sclerosis. In sclerotic panatrophy, as the name signifies, there is sclerosis along with panatrophy. The panatrophy of Grover is characterized by sharply defined areas of atrophy. There is one or more. Irregular in size, vary from 2 to 20 centimeter. Shape may be circular, triangular, or quadrangular. Distribution is back, buttock, leg, and arms. Develop over a period of few, few weeks without any preceding inflammatory stage. In each affected area, the subcutaneous tissue disappear and the overlying skin appear atrophic but is otherwise normal. So mainly the subcutaneous tissue is gone but skin is atrophic but otherwise normal. While in sclerotic panatrophy, atrophy of subcutaneous tissue along with underlying muscle and bone may follow clinically and histologically typical morphia, especially when the process begins in childhood and involves the limb. So the morphia gradually becomes deepened and deepened, leading to uh, due to loss of muscle and the bone. And it may also occur in absence of morphia. Usually it occurs in a linear, linear fashion or bands encircling the limbs or the trunk. It ceases to progress after a few months, although new areas may be involved. Now there is a term which is called as the facial hemiatrophy, also known as the peri romberg syndrome. Facial hemiatrophy is atrophic dysplasia of superficial facial tissue, but the underlying muscle, cartilage, and bone may also be affected. A rare disorder seen in first two decades, both sexes equally affected. Cause is unknown and may be a disorder of sympathetic nervous system. No evidence of genetically, uh, genetically transmission, but appears to be hereditary in few pedigrees. Clinical features. First manifestation is increase or decrease pigmentation in irregular patches on cheek, forehead, and lower jaw. It is always unilateral. So progressive atrophy in affected areas which involve the skin, subcutis, muscle, and bone, but progresses for months or years. The skin become dry, thin, and atrophic, may be scar-like, and adherent in some areas. When atrophy is fully developed, the contrast between affected half of the face and affected half and unaffected half is dramatic. Here are lost in front of parietal region on the affected side with localized canities or white hairs. So you can see the extreme degree of facial hemifacial hypo um, hemifacial atrophy hemiatrophy. This is a child and it progressively develops this hemifacial atrophy. A variety of neurological signs, especially Horner syndrome and heterochromy of iris develop at the same time. The degree of bone atrophy established radiologically is usually much less than the clinical appearance suggests. Differential diagnoses include physiological asymmetry, unilateral mandibular agenesis, hemihypertrophy, and atrophy secondary to facial paralysis. If limbs are involved, infantile hemiplegia and lipodystrophy should also be considered as the differentials. Lupus paniculitis result in subcutaneous atrophy, which can be hemifacial. Then atrophic morphia or coup de saber. It is a paramedian form with some degree of facial hemiatrophy. However, it is more superficial. So the skin in scleroderma is bound down and adherent and loss of hairs and pigmentary changes are conspicuous. While in progressive facial hemiatrophy, skin remains mobile and grossly normal. So this will be the point of differentiation from the uh, encudi saber morphia. In encudi saber morphia, the skin will be bound down and thickened and attached to the sclerotic dermis, while in facial hemiatrophy, the skin will be normal, although atrophic. Complications. There is associated segmental vitiligo and a spontaneous fracture of the jaw. Atrophy may remain limited both in extent and in depth. 
it may be confined to distribution of one division of trigeminal nerve or involve the whole one side of the face with sharp demarcation at the midline. Rarely it may be bilateral or involve the whole half of the body, usually on the same side where the face is involved. Management is only by plastic surgery by using large buried pediculated flaps of dermis, autologous fat and silicone implant. Now we are going to discuss the disorders of elastic fiber and its degradation. The lax skin. You all know the laxity of the skin is mainly because of loss of elasticity. So once the elastic fibers are disintegrated, the skin will become lax. It's a sign of aging and accelerated by dermal photoaging and occasionally result from marked weight loss. And it also result from recovery of gross edema. So there are different causes of lax skin, the generalized elastolysis, cutis laxa. The cutis, the generalized, the congenital cutis laxa we discussed in my previous talk. And uh, it is uh, a component of inherited disorders like pseudoxanthoma elasticum, scarf syndrome. Scarf syndrome is skeletal abnormalities with cutis laxa, craniostenosis, Ambiguous, ambiguous genitalia, retardation, and facial abnormalities. De Bursa syndrome, angenodermatosis, osteodysplastica. We are concerned with acquired cutis, cutis laxa. It is because of the inflammatory skin diseases like multiple myelomas, SLE, <clears throat> hypersensitivity reaction, complement deficiency, and penicillamine therapy. There can be localized elastolysis, which, is, uh, which include anetodermas, Blepharoclasis, blepharoclasis, chronic, atrophic, acrodermatitis, we discussed it before, the granulomatous slack skin, mid-dermal and post-inflammatory elastolysis, <clears throat> then elastic tissue nev nev nevi. All the conditions share the same pathological process, that is elastophagocytosis, that is phagocytosis of the elastic fibers by histocytes and multinucleated giant cells. Acquired cutis laxa. It follows the inflammatory skin disease uh, or exposed in utero to drugs like penicillin. Immunological pathogenesis is suggested. There is widespread massive folds of lax skin or changes may be mild purpura following slight trauma and fibrotic nodules over bony prominences. Organs other than the skin is involved, resulting in emphysema, gastric fibromas, and tracheobronchiomegaly. So you can see this acquired cutis laxa. The laxity of the skin is much pronounced as compared to the age of the patient. Clinical variant is a Marshall syndrome, which is post-inflammatory elastolysis in cutaneous cutis laxa. There is a preceding inflammatory lesion, which is urticaria-like. The differential diagnosis to acquired cutis laxa are Ehler-Danlos syndrome, but the skin is hyperextensible, not lax. And there is yellowish, it is yellowish and face is usually spared. Circumscribed folds of lax skin is also seen in neurofibromatosis and leprechunism, Peterson syndrome and trisomy 18. In severe actinic damage, there may be marked skin laxity due to damage to elastic fibers. Diagnosis is confirmed by finding the reduction in elastic fibers and the management is by plastic surgery to improve the cosmetic disability. Now the anetodermas. So the term anetodermas may, may include the loves anetos which means slack. So it means the slack skin. So it's a circumscribed area of slack skin associated with loss of dermal substance on palpation and loss of elastic tissue on histological examination. So there is primary endoderma and there is secondary endoderma. The primary endoderma implies, uh, implies no associated localized cutaneous disease whereas secondary endoderma is attributed to some associated conditions. 
The endodermas are previously identified as primary endodermas, which, uh, sorry, the, the primary endodermas are previously divided into two types, the jettison Pelizzeri syndrome and schwinger and schwinger Buzi syndrome. The difference is there is preceding erythema in jettison Pelizzeri, while no preceding inflammation in schwinger Buzi. The prognosis and histology is identical in both types. The endodermas are rare disorders seen in 20 to 40 years women. And primary endodermas is primarily associated with antiphospholipid syndrome with or without other features of SLE. So once you discover an endoderma, it is must to investigate on this line. And then there is a definite association with syphilis and its treatment. So the second cause of primary endoderma can be syphilis. Secondary endoderma is reported with tuberculosis, leprosy, urticaria pigmentosa, petriasis versicolor, granuloma annular, Steven Johnson syndrome, and B and T cell lymphoma. The localized endoderma like changes on histology is reported in association with pilometricoma, dermatofibroma, juvenile xanthogranuloma, and hematomatous congenital nevi. Biopsy show focal loss of elastic tissue and perivascular infiltrate with predominant prominent plasma cells. There is a serological evidence of Borrelia burgdorferi infection in some cases. Clinical feature, primary endoderma characterized by crops of round or oval pink macules, 0.5 to 1 centimeter in diameter on trunk, thigh and upper arms. The macule extend for a few weeks or two and reach a size of 2 to 3 centimeters and sometimes nodule develop. Slowly, each lesion fades and flatten from center outwards, leaving a wrinkled atrophic skin which yields on pressure admitting the finger. So if you introduce your finger into the nodule of an endoderma, the finger is going to go inside the skin. The number of lesions varies widely from few to hundred, five to hundred. So these are the few soft nodules and the characteristic feature of these nodules that if you palpate, they, you will feel that it has a very soft texture and atrophic skin. And if you admit your finger, the finger will go right into the skin. Atrophic areas and secondary endoderma do not always develop at the site of known inflammatory lesion, so can develop at other sites. They are soft round oval areas, mainly on the trunk. Confetti-like macular atrophy is a variant of endoderma. Differential diagnosis, extra genital LSAs, lichen sclerosis, present as white spots around the base of the neck and shoulder and should not be confused with any two dermas and focal dermal hypoplasia and atrophic scar must also be considered. The disease course and prognosis, the disease remain unchanged throughout the life. New lesions often continue to develop for several years. In patients with primary endoderma, it is important to test for antiphospholipid syndrome and treat appropriately. I would like to add that also order the VDRL. Management. No specific treatment exists. In case of secondary endoderma, treatment should be directed against the specific disease or infection. Penicillin, an antifibrinolytic drug like alpha amino caproic acid, is advocated, but whence, whence at all found no treatment benefit. Colchicine may prevent atrophic changes. Ablative CO2 laser may reduce the scarring. Mid-dermal elastolysis. Idiopathic loss of elastic fiber in mid-dermis leads to widespread wrinkling of crinkle type in otherwise healthy young or middle-aged women. Localized area may clinically resemble pseudoxanthoma elasticum, but they are histologically distinct. Patient is young or middle-aged and female and fair skin. 
elastates producing strains of staph or staphylococcus epidermidis have been implicated in perifollicular variant. Ultraviolet light may also trigger the elastophagocytosis and condition is also reported in patient undergoing hemodialysis. There are three variants of mid-dermal elastolysis. Type 1 is characterized by cigarette paper-like fine wrinkles affecting trunk and upper arms. Type 2 is perifollicular, a small gray-white finely wrinkled round or oval areas. They occur on upper trunk, neck, earlobes and arms. And type 3 is the reticular variant, orange rent inflammatory papules, precede net like areas of atrophy chiefly on the arms. So this side shows the reticulate pattern, this side shows the cigarette paper pattern. Upper dermal elastolysis, this is a rare condition and related to acquired pseudosynthoma elasticum. Selective loss of elastic tissue in papillary dermis present with numerous yellow, yellow papules on the neck and upper trunk associated with coarse wrinkles. So the appearance is similar to fever ricochet. No definitive treatment, but topical retinoids would bring some improvement. Reduction in degradation of metalloproteinases would also, is also desirable. Blephroclasis. It is a condition where the laxity of eyelid skin is mainly due to defect in elastic tissue. It is mostly sporadic, develop around the time of puberty, mainly in white people. Some pedigree show autosomal dominance, although most cases are sporadic. There is attack of painless swelling of eyelids, uh, usually preceding this laxity. And it's associated with atrophy, wrinkling and pigmentation from predominantly of the upper eyelid and multiple telling dictasias. So, such kind of uh, aged appearance of upper eyelid in a young or adolescent individual female is blephrocalysis. And the changes produce appearance of tiredness and premature aging. So, you can see this huge upper lid blephrocalysis. A clinical variant is Usher syndrome. This is characterized by blephrocalysis with progressive enlargement of upper lip due to hypertrophy and inflammation of labial salivary glands. The enlarged lip appears soft and lobulated and there is excessive salivation. In addition to these two features, uh, accessory lacrimal glands are also affected with results in increased thickness of eyelids. So not only brephrocalysis, but eyelids may be thickened, thickness of the lip, and in most cases, goiter is reported as a part of the syndrome. So you can see the thick, the blephrocalysis, the protruding upper eyelids, and thick lips. Differential diagnosis is blephrocalysis as a generalized manifestation of cutis lexa. Lexity of eyelid skin is age-related, and lexity also occur in allied endosome. Plastic surgery is the only option here. Actinic granulomas or anodal elastotic giant cell granuloma. They are also known as O barren granuloma or Mischer's granuloma of the face. The actinic granuloma is an uncommon condition affecting the act actinically damaged skin, result from, resulting from low grade reactive inflammatory process with degenerated elastic fibers, which are phagocytosed and surrounded by multinucleated giant cells and histocytes. Actinic granulomas, as the name signifies, occur on sun-exposed skins and manifest as slowly enlarging annular plaques with elevated erythematous margins, leaving behind central areas of atrophy, which is devoid of elastic fibers. It is associated with diabetes in 40% of the cases. And this actinic granuloma is associated with burn scars, with prolonged doxycycline photosensitivity and prolonged sunbed exposure. It's more common in sunny countries, usually over the age of 30, and fits Patrick type 1 skin. So all these uh, features fits in Australia and New Zealand. So histology is characterized by homogeneous eosinophilic. So homogeneous 
eosinophilic or basophilic degeneration of elastic tissue and surrounding dense connectivity, uh, college, uh, granulomatous inflammation. If we do this uh, elastic stain, you can see the ab absence of elastin uh, tissue in this granulomatous infiltration. And on high power magnification, you can see this elastic fibers are engulfed into the multinucleated giant cells. Clinical features characterized by one or more skin colored papules or nodules on sun damaged skin, like face, dorsal of hand and forearm and V of the neck and bald scalp. Fair skin is particularly susceptible. There is gradual enlargement of these nodules into the annular lesions. And the ring initially measured a few millimeter, but gradually expands to attain several centimeters. So you can see these large annular rings of actinic granulomas. Clinical variants it may represent an annular form of cutaneous sarcoidosis, or granuloma multiformy also mimics or look or is considered as a variant of actinic granuloma. The differential diagnoses include granuloma annular, necrobiasis, lipoidica, which also occur on the face, and elastosis, perforans, serpaginosa, and sarcoidosis. Disease course and prognosis, it, it improves with adequate sun protection. Investigation is skin biopsy. Management, no treatment of benefit. Topical steroids are unhelpful. Successful treatment by intralegional triamcin alone, oral hydroxychloroquine, isotretinoin, and acetretin. Then Depsone, methotrexate, and cyclosporin are also tried, and topical tacrolimus is sometimes found beneficial. Granuloma multiforme. It is a dermatosis which is reported in dark skinned people of Africa and India. It shares similarity with actinic granuloma and is characterized by annular plaques with giant cell granuloma formation at the periphery and loss of elastic tissue centrally. As with actinic granuloma, it presents with papules which enlarge to form annular plaques with raised edge and attain several centimeter in diameter. So you can see in this picture, there are multiple collagen papules to form annular lesions. Histologically, granuloma multiformy is slightly different um, from uh, actinic granuloma because there are irregular areas of necrobiasis. However, palisading is inconsistent, which is quite consistent in granuloma multiformy. So in addition to histocyte, multinuclear giant cells are also seen. Histologically, the condition is distinguished from actinic granuloma in having the focal necrobiasis and presence of dermal mucin, which both are not seen in actinic granuloma. It, the importance lies in its superficial resemblance to tuberculoid leprosy, which is an important differential point and skin biopsy is must to uh, differentiate these two. Occur, the disease predominantly occur in female over age of 40, and those with intense sun exposure. Management, no treatment is known to be effective. Then word about granulometer slack skin. It is again an elastolytic condition characterized by slow development of pendulous folds of lax erythematous skin. His logical examinations show dense granulometer dermal infiltrates with destruction of dermal elastic tissue. It is now considered to be a type of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, where epidermotropism and abnormal T-cells are also seen in the dermis. Acquired pseudoxanthoma elastic. It can be of diff uh, due to different causes. Itrogenic. So acquired pseudoxanthoma elasticum is seen by the after the use of penicillamine, while the systemic features of pseudoxanthoma elasticum are not seen. That is no involvement of uh, heart. It ex is and eyes. It is explained by known effects of penicillamine in inhibiting collagen and elastin cross-linking. Trans epidermal elimination of elastic elastic fiber elastin is also seen. That is perforation. Toxin also reported in eosinophil myalgia syndrome with absence of dermal calcification. Eosinophilia myalgia syndrome is characterized by incapacitating myalgias, blood eosinophilia more than 1,000 cells per microliter, 
no evidence of infection or neoplasms. It is also related toxic oil syndrome caused by ingestion of L-tryptophan. Then deposition, yellow papules and plaques resembling pseudoxanthoma elasticum is seen in patients with amyloidosis. Dermal calcification is again absent. And then pseudoxanthum, then hematological diseases like hemoglobinopathies, congenital anemia, sickle cell disease, and thalassemias. Saltpeter disease. Saltpetri disease. This disease resembles pseudoxanthoma elasticum clinically, seen in elderly farmers who have been, been earlier exposed to the fertilizer containing calcium ammonium nitrate, also known as Norwegian saltpetri. None of the patient had positive family history or signs of pseudoxanthoma elasticum earlier, but developed acquired pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Acrokeratoelastoidosis. It manifests as multiple tiny crateriform keratotic papules along the margins of hand and feet, particularly African descent. As the name signifies, histology shows epidermal acanthosis and hyperkeratosis with fragmentation of underlying dermal elastic fibers. It's an autosomal dominant condition and present until after puberty. Sporadic acids also occur. So acrokeratoelastoides. It is different from um, marginal hyperkeratosis or kerato or keratotic uh, lesions which we have described before, which occur on the margin, which is seen in sun-exposed manual workers. But this is an autosomal dominant or sporadic condition. Then acquired disorders of elastin tissue deposition. We till now discussed those conditions in which elastic tissue is degenerated or deficient. Now a few conditions in which there is elastic tissue deposition. Linear focal elastosis, characterized by yellow linear bands arranged horizontally on the lower back, common on leg and shoulder, and it represents keloidal reaction to stria distancing. Mainly seen in elderly, Elastogenesis occur in response to local trauma, ultraviolet light, superficially resembles the lesion resembles tri distancy, but are palpable rather than depressed and yellow rather than purplish or white. Linear focal elastosis is reported adjacent to stri distancy. The disease course and prognosis lesions probably regress with time. Late onset focal dermal elastosis characterized by PUD orange appearance on flexures reported in Japanese men. Elastoderma dorsi. Elastofibroma, sorry, elastofibroma dorsi. It occurs predominantly elderly women. Their history of prolonged manual labor. Painless, slightly tender swellings. Solitary or multiple beneath the lower angle of scapula. 2 to 10 centimeter in diameter. It's a benign lesion. However, despite the fact, it's poorly circumscribed. Growth is composed of mature fibrous tissue containing fibers which stain with elastic fiber. Papular elastorexis, seen in adults, adolescent and young, present with multiple non-follicular, oval, white or yellow papules on trunk and limbs. The dermal elastic fiber are decreased and fragmented on histology. Most cases reports are sporadic, no family history. Interlegional triamcinol is helpful as a treatment option. So this brings to end of a long lecture and I hope to join you next time with another portion of the similar chapter. Thank you all and have a good day and a good weekend. Goodbye and happy, happy listening to all of you.